464, 464, 464. Let's sing that chorus, Lord be glorified. Let's sing it out together. rest of this week in our lives, that the Lord would be glorified with all that is said, done, and even sung here tonight. It says in Deuteronomy 6.1, it says this, and I think I have it on the screen so you can follow along quickly. It says, now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it, that thou might that Thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee. Thou and thy son and thy son's sons, son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, and as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Amen? Amen. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. But he doesn't stop there, does he? And thou shalt teach them. Don't miss this. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. I don't think our Christian walk can be a secret. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and, and they shall be as, a, as frontless between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, the very walls of your house, and on thy gates. Now, although we are not Israel... We understand, even from uh, this last several weeks on Sunday nights, that we realize in, in our study in Ezra that the Old Testament is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in our Christian walk. Is it not? That means, families, that we have a charge from God to make much of God in our life and in our home. You shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with thy soul and with all thy might. As we begin family conference, let's start first with that knowledge, that we have a charge from God to make much of him in our life. Here, here is the question that, with the Lord's help, we will attempt to answer in the next several days. How do we do that? As families, how do we do that? Fathers, how do we bind them for a sign upon your hand? Mothers, how do we make your love for God so clear in the home that it is as if it is pasted on your forehead? Right in the middle of your forehead, it is God and his love and his grace is just pouring out of us. Young people, how do you see your home? Is it evident that Christ is not only welcomed there, but the very post and doorways are saturated with God's love and guidance. Families, we need to get real with God this week. Do you need a Baptist church? We need to get real with God this week. The family structure is under attack, isn't it? The very structure, the very foundation that God has placed 
is under attack. Why? Because Satan knows that the will of God is for families to teach their children the love of God. Moms and dads teaching their children that God is good. May we get real about protecting our homes from the devil. May we get real about teaching our children and our teenagers the Bible. May we get real about our lack of love for God and with the Lord's help do something about it. Starting tonight. So let's go ahead and begin or continue this evening with a word of prayer as we start Family Conference 22. Let's pray. Lord, we ask for your guidance tonight. Lord, we ask for your working. Lord, I pray that you would open our minds, open our hearts tonight for exactly what you have. It may be completely different for the person sitting next to us, but Lord, we ask for you to work in our hearts in a way that only you can. I pray that you would empower your servant. Lord, we thank you for the Copelands, for their willingness and ability to be here with us. And Lord, I ask that you just be a blessing to them as he blesses us with your word tonight. Lord, I ask that we would get real with you, that the teenagers here tonight would get real about their Christian walk, that moms and dads would get real about it. They would see it as a necessity, that it was the will of God that we would make a home after your own heart. We love you, Lord. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and continue our singing with 457, 457, Walk Worthy of the Lord. desire. Let's continue singing about our Almighty Father. Almighty Father, you alone are holy.
song, isn't it? Our God is holy and worthy to be praised. I'm going to sing a song for you. We're going, to, we're going to make this into our conference song. It's a newer song, so I'm going to sing it for you, and then you're going to join me in singing it together to live or die. together to live is Christ I long to spend. And when 
we'll continue singing that on Friday night, and then on Sunday we'll sing it again together. Well, we're privileged uh, this evening to have for our family conference the Copelands, Kurt and Christy, and uh, we were able to meet them, Pastor Steve and the, and the youth group and I met them at snow camp, and uh, it was such a joy to get to know them and, and talk with them, and, and, uh, and so I, I did a little stalking on his website to come up with an actual like intro, because I didn't know that much about you, like I couldn't just say, welcome brother, uh, you know, Copeland. Uh, I do know, uh, if anybody is asking, he is uh, a, sadly not related to uh, a brother Kenneth Copeland, uh, if, but uh, if you don't know who that is, never mind. Uh, but uh, Kurt was a, uh, was a bus kid in Pekin, Illinois, and uh, praise the Lord, he trusted Christ as his personal Savior on January 11, uh, 1982, at Emmanuel Baptist in Mattoon, Illinois. And after moving to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, he worked at the, uh, at the Bill Rice Ranch uh, as a ranch hand, uh, during the summer of 1986, and it was there that he surrendered to full-time Christian service. He attended Pensacola Christian College, uh, and he then later married Christy on January uh, 1st, right, 1994. And I just want to stop here and ask, is that your marriage advice to any, uh, pe any guys getting married? Make it like the first of the year so you never forget your anniversary? Okay, good. I was saying, I saw that. I was like, man, what a way to never forget your anniversary. Got young guys, pay attention. Get married on a day that you can never forget. Uh, Kurt soon after answered the call to return to Franklin Road Baptist Church as their youth pastor. They have two uh, daughters. One is a teacher and uh, one is uh, newly engaged, correct? Or is that the same one? Okay, good. Angel and Gabriel. Kurt earned a master's degree in biblical studies in 2009 and then earned a doctorate degree in pastoral ministries in 2017. While serving as a youth pastor for about 26 years there at Franklin Road, God richly blessed their youth ministry and uh, uh, upwards uh, an average of over 200 teens in attendance. Uh, that, that's a big youth group, all right? Uh, souls saved uh, weekly, teenagers surrendering to the will of God and touch of God was very evident in their ministry. It has always been Kurt's desire to see teens saved and surrendered to live for the Lord with their life, and along with that, their family, the family connection that goes with it. After nearly 28 years serving, uh, of serving in youth work uh, together, Kurt and Christy turned in their resignation in January of 2020. What a great time, right, to turn in resignation and hit the road for evangelism, huh? Nothing else going on, um, you know, roads and, and everything completely open, no. Uh, but uh, praise the Lord, uh, answering the call, and uh, he's been, they've been richly blessed over the last several years in, on the road uh, in full-time evangelism. And now we are privileged to have them minister to us. So I'm going to ask Brother Kurt if you'd come on up. Uh, we are thrilled to have you and your wife here and uh, sharing God's word. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, listen as he speaks. Listen to the Holy Spirit as he speaks. Right. Brother Turpin, thank, thank you so much. so much. Well, what an honor to be here tonight. And uh, I am thankful you came to church. Thank you for being here. Wednesday night, and there's a great crowd here. I, I'm impressed. I really am. That's, uh, that's not common. It really isn't. And I'm thankful you're here. And uh, families, thank you for putting the emphasis. Dads. Thank you for putting the emphasis on bringing your family to church tonight. I want to encourage you to be here for every meeting, especially men the skeet shoot Saturday. That's, a, that's an important part. Well, we'll do some spiritual things too, but the skeet shoot should be a lot of fun too. I'm a Tennessee boy. I was born in Illinois, so I'm a Yankee by birth, but I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm, southern, I'm southern all the way through now. And uh, so don't, don't cast me off yet. But being southern, you think everyone down there has guns and all that kind of stuff? I do. I, I, have, I have that stuff. But I don't shoot a lot, so some of y'all are going to laugh at me at the skeet shoot, no doubt about it. I, I'm not talented, and uh, I know to shoot in the right general direction, but, uh, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, perfect, thank you. And uh, I, I know to shoot in the right general direction, so you don't have to be fearful. I, I taught a Sunday school class, an adult couple Sunday school class, for the last, oh, 15 years or so, and uh, we had a large, large couples class there, and, and our men of our class, they always got on to me, because I'm really not a hunterman, a hunterman. I'm not a hunter or a fisherman, either one. Uh, you know, I'd rather watch, you know, paint dry than to fish. And uh, I, it's just not my thing. And, uh, but these guys, they always gave me a hard time. They said, if you're going to be from the South, you've got to do this stuff. 
And so we went out for this uh, men's outdoor. Well, it was a family picnic. All the men went to the back part of the property, and they had guns. They had a 50 caliber handgun. And uh, they set this, this uh, um, gel target up. And one of the guys came to me and said, Brother Kurt, you think you can hit that? I said, I, I don't think so. He said, with this gun, you can't miss. I mean, the barrel of the gun was, you know, like, like two foot long, it seemed like. And he said, just brace yourself, because this is a big boy. And he said, it'll knock you over, just the pistol will. And I said, ah. So I got braced. I got it all ready, receiving. I, I'm, I'm ready to shoot. And, and uh, he said, just aim for the head. I said, what if I miss? He said, trust me, you're not going to miss. I shot, and that thing, it exploded. I mean, it, it was, it, I was like, yes, I'm not going to shoot again, because I finally hit a target. And uh, I was so pleased with it. And, and uh, I'm excited about this week. I really am. We are thrilled to be here. My wife, Chrissy. Chrissy, would you stand for just a moment? We have been married for 28 years, uh, six months, and hold on a second, 22 days and uh, five hours within seven minutes. And uh, seven minutes from now, it'll be five hours. You say, are you that romantic? No, I got married January the 1st. And it's real easy to do the math. The wedding was at 2.30. So, or excuse me, we were married by 2.30. So I, 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 I love doing that. We've got two daughters, and uh, I, am, I am thrilled to death. By the way, I remember as a young man hearing preachers say something to this effect. They'd say, you know, uh, their, their youngest or their child was getting ready to go off to college or, or getting married and moving out. And I remember them saying, you know, this is the hardest time of our life, you know, having that empty nest, and we won't even know what to do with ourselves, and this is just miserable. You know what I found out? They're liars. Those men all lied. And uh, we are experiencing an empty nest right now, and we are having the time of our life. And uh, I can't wait till we have grandchildren. I really can't. And uh, then go ahead and bring the grandchildren over for a few hours only, but bring them over. And uh, they're not going to spend the night because I like my sleep, but bring the grandkids over. We'll sugar them up. We'll, we'll teach them all the bad things to do, and we'll send them back home. And uh, we'll have a good old time with them and let you deal with it. But uh, we, are, we really are. We're having the time of our life. Our youngest just got engaged. And uh, her fiancé is from Cleveland, Ohio, and, and I was preaching up in that general area and uh, about five hours from there, actually. He drove over. He called me on the phone. He said, can I talk to you? And I said, well, I'm kind of busy. And uh, I kind of knew what he was getting ready to ask me. And I said, I'm kind of busy. And he said, well, it's, it's kind of important. I'd really like to talk to you. And I said, well, let me look at my schedule and get back to you. I'll see if I can work out a time to talk to you. And he's like, well, uh, I said, well, okay, let's just walk through it right now. And so we started walking through the schedule. And he said, how about this date? I said, no, I can't. He said, how about this date? And I said, no, I can't. He said, how about this? No, I'm not. I'm, and we went through like 10 dates. and he could. So the, the boy's almost crying. And I said, tell you what, I'll be up that way. We'll meet there. And anyway, we worked it all out. And uh, just about uh, four weeks ago or, or so now, uh, he asked my youngest daughter to marry him. And uh, they're working on wedding plans now, and we're, we're, ex we're excited about it all. We really are, having the time of our life. And, uh, but we're thrilled to be here. I, I want you to tonight, I, I, really the whole weekend, I want you just to focus on this one thought. God, what can I do different in my home? This, it's a family conference, which really means this. It, it's a conference on the home. So what, what I mean by that is this. Dad, this, this weekend is for you. Mom, this weekend is for you. Uh, Grandma, Grandpa, this weekend is for you. Uh, widow, Widower, this weekend is for you. Children, teenagers, this weekend's for you. We want to look at God's Word. We want to take some things from God's Word and say, God, what can you teach me from your Word to help me be a better husband, father, uh, employee? Uh, God, what can you teach me to be a better mom or child? God, what can you teach me to be a better grandparent? I want my home to bring honor and glory to God. That, that's what I want. I want God, when He sees the Copeland home, to, to not, not to say it's a perfect home. Would you agree with me there's no such thing as a perfect home? Have you, ever, have you ever been guilty of coming to church? By the way, I love interaction, so feel free to speak out to me. I'm, I'm good. I've been a youth pastor for 28 years. I'm used to people speaking out to me. Usually not very nice, but I'm used to it. But uh, have you ever, you ever been guilty of coming to church? Am I okay to move around a little bit? Okay. Um, have you ever been guilty of coming to church and, and seeing someone else's family and thinking, 
what's wrong with my family? Uh, maybe you've, you've come in through the back doors and, and you saw another family come in and all their children, they come in walking single file, maybe even holding hands, and, and they walk in and they sit down in their seat and they sit in their seat and their, their backs are to the back of the pew and their hands are folded on their lap and you look over and you think, what, what, what's going on? And you look down the road, your children, and they're, you know, stabbing each other with pins and, and, and throwing each other on the ground and scribbling inside the songbook. And you, you know, they're destroying And you're thinking, what are we doing wrong? And can I tell you, there's no such thing as a perfect home. About two of you agree with me there. There's no such thing as a perfect home. Every home is made up of sinners. Have you ever been guilty, by the way, don't say amen to this one, okay? I'm just helping you out ahead of time. Have you ever been guilty of, of coming to church and, and seeing another couple in church who's married and they're sitting there and they're like snuggled up close together and he's got his arm around her and she's got her, his, her, her head on his shoulder and they, 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 sing, they stand to sing the songs and they hold hands and there you are with your spouse and you're like, the great gulf is fixed between you. You know, you're in heaven and, well, anyway, the great gulf is fixed between you. And you're wondering, where did it all go? Why can't we have a marriage like theirs? Can I tell you? They have struggles in their marriage, too. They can put on a good show at church. My wife and I, we, we, we call it this, Pastor. We, we, we don't have arguments. We call them discussions. It's the same thing. We just sugarcoat it like it's not as bad. But we have discussions often. Usually it's when I'm right behind the steering wheel of the car. And, and I'm not driving up to her expectation, which is pretty much every time I'm driving. And, or I make the wrong turn or I'm too close to the line. We have one of those uh, alerts on, on one of our vehicles that when you get too close to the line, it sets off this buzzer. I've been in some other vehicles where it kind of nudges your wheel and kind of brings you back in. And, but ours doesn't. Ours is just a buzzer. So it's... And, and, and I, I hate that because I, tend, I pay my taxes, so I like to drive on all parts of the road. I want to test that. That rumble strip is there for a reason. That rumble strip is there so that I know I'm getting, I don't need a buzzer in my car for that. And, and if I get a little too close to one line or the other, my wife likes to tell me, hey, what, watch the road. I, I like to watch everything but the road. I like to look at the farmland. I like to see the cattle. I like to do all that. My wife doesn't like that when I do that too much. What I'm saying is this. There's no such thing as a perfect marriage. Hey, teenagers, do you know that other teenage friend you have and her parents or his parents that are so cool and your parents are not as cool? You know what I'm talking about? By the way, don't say amen there either. Can, can I tell you? Their parents aren't as cool as you think. Their parents every now and then drop a hammer on them too. The, the discipline comes out. You think, well, no. No one has a home as hard as my home. My parents have so many rules. So does every home. Every home does. By the way, parents, you ever looked at someone else's teenager and thought, man, my, I wish my teenager acted like that. Well, no, you don't live with them. I, I, I made a habit of when I was walking through the church hallway around parents, I would look at parents of teenagers and I would say to those parents, hey, I just want to tell you, I, your, your child is one of the best kids in the entire youth ministry. And more times than not, that parent would stop. And after he got up off the ground, he'd look at me and say, hey, whoa, 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 what did you say? I, I said, your, your child, your teenager is one of the best teenagers in, in the whole youth ministry. And they said, whoa, 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 no. He said, just come live one day in our house and you might see what this teenager is really like. Can I tell you, we're all good at putting on a show, aren't we? Two of us are. Thank you. Truth is, we're all good at it. Well, let me just prove this. Brother Stephen, have you and your wife ever had a good knockdown, drag out, just you know, obviously you were wrong, she was right. But have you ever had one of those discussions where you're thinking, Ugh! don't answer that publicly. <laughs> the answer is yes. The answer is, 
She's nodding her head. He's not willing to yet. He's a smart man. He's been trained well. Truth is, every couple has. Hey, how many of y'all have ever seen them have a knockdown, drag out? Just, or, you know, they walked through the doors last Sunday and they're like, I'm telling you, I'm, you're never going to fix that. Me- have any of y'all ever seen? I'm looking. I don't see any hands up. Why? What, what? Excuse me. Why does that happen like that? Why? Because they're good at putting on a show. So, so hold on. By the way, I'm picking on y'all. It's what you pastors are supposed to be. You know. The same thing can be said about every couple in the room. You know that last argument you had? By the way, I don't want to pull the scab off of anybody, any wounds here. But all of us have had them. I remember I preached a message at my home church a number of years ago, and I simply made a statement like that in the service. that Every couple has discussions. Every couple has those times where eh, it's not as happy as it was when they were standing at the altar holding hands. Every couple has it. And as soon as the service was over, there was a man who came, came from the back of the auditorium. He, he, and I saw him. I, I finished preaching. I, I stepped down off the platform and came off to the side. I was talking to another couple, and I saw the corner of my eye. Here came this man. He had his wife by the hand, and literally he's dragging her. And she's like... And there, she's dragging, he's dragging her to the front, and he gets up to the front. I finish talking to the other person. I turn around, and there he catches me. He said, Brother Copeland, I want you to know, you said every couple has discussions. And I just want you to know, my wife and I, we've been married for 45 years or something like that. And he said, we have never once ever had an argument in our home. And he jerked his wife by the arm, pulled her up there closer, and he said, you tell him, honey, isn't that true? We have never had an argument. Jerked up and said, you tell him. She said, uh-huh. And they turned around and walked away. Can I tell you, we all struggle. We're all guilty of coming to church, singing the songs, forgive me for saying it this way, playing the game, doing what's expected of us. So that no one thinks bad of us. I remember as a kid growing up. I'll get to the, the Bible here in a second, I promise. But I remember as a kid growing up. We lived in Illinois. We didn't go to church very much. My parents had a roller skating rink. They had a family business. We literally lived inside the roller skating rink. That was, our house was in the roller skating rink building. It's another story I'll tell you later. But, but I remember we, we left the roller skating business. We moved to another little city in central Illinois and... My, my family didn't go to, we really didn't go to church. The business took place of going to church. And so we rode the bus to go to church the, as kids. I remember one Sunday morning, my family got up together and we all started going to church together that Sunday morning, which was very rare. It, we, we were Creaster Christians. You know what I mean when I say Creaster? Christmas and Easter only Christians. That was the only, that was the only time we went as a family to church. And I remember we started going to church on this, it had to be Easter morning because it was, wasn't winter out. And, and I remember we got in the, in the big van, a conversion van with, with the sink in the back and the curtains and, and, and four Copeland little rug rat kids jump in the back of this van. But before we ever got in the van, we were all getting up and getting ready, you know, and still had the bed head and the hair, the hair all disheveled and shirts uh, buttoned were misbuttoned and, and, you know, one higher than the other and, and, and no belt and mismatched shoes. I mean, we were a mess. And, and we, we knew we were all going to church because my dad had gotten up and, and, and got his coffee ready and went out and got in the van real early, which he never went to church with us. And I remember we heard the horn honking out in the driveway. Uh, 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 woman, let's go. Uh, uh, uh. And I remember four of us boys go waddling out and, and, and jump in the back of the van. We get in the van and, and I remember my dad hollering back and said, where's your mom at? I said, well, she's in the house, dad. She's still, ah, 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 woman, let's go. Neighbors are poking their head out thinking, are we supposed to be going somewhere? <laughs> you know, and, and, ah, ah, ah. And, and finally my mom comes out of the door. She's carrying a stack of Bibles. She's got, she's got like, like everyone else's belts in their hand. That we all forgot our belts. and She's carrying everything out there. She gets in the van, puts everything down, and sits down. <sighs> and then my dad started in on her. I mean, it was war. 
You know, one of those discussion times where we as kids, we were sitting in the back and it was like we were keeping score. Like dad would say, oh, and we're like, oh, that was a good one, dad. And then mom would, my, mom actually just sat there as quiet as could be. And dad was just letting her have it. It was about a five minute drive is all it was to church. The old country road. About halfway down that road, my dad said something to my mom and it exploded. I mean, my mom had enough. And she said something, I don't even remember what she said back, but she said something back to dad, and we were in the back like, oh, that was a good one, mom. And we were keeping score. And it, my dad got so mad. My dad, this is the first vehicle we ever had that had power windows. Young people, there used to be a day when you had a little crank on the door to lower that window down, not just pushing a button. I mean, I know that's hard to believe, but there used to be a day like that. And, and I, I remember my dad pushed the button and lowered my mom's window. And he reached over and he grabbed one of those huge coffee mugs. It held an entire pot of coffee. I mean, it was one, and he was a coffeeaholic. And, and he drank that thing all day long. He had that coffee mug sitting there in the middle of that console. He lowered my mom's window. He reached over and grabbed that coffee mug full of hot coffee. And he threw it. I, to this day, I still don't know what he was doing. I've never asked. That coffee mug went flying right in front of my mom, right out the window into the ditch. We were in the back of the car, and we were like, Ooh, you know, hiding now. I mean, it, it, it went bad. We were acting like we didn't see anything. We pulled in the church parking lot. My dad looked over at my mom, and he said this. He said, I will never do this again. I will never wait on you. We'll ne I'll never be at church with you. This is terrible. I'm done. I'm finished. He's mad. He threw the van door open. He stepped out one step onto the gravel parking lot of Effingham Baptist Temple in Effingham, Illinois. Got out of the van, said something else derogatory back in to my mom. Turned around and before he could shut the door, another man in the church was across the parking lot, hollered out and said, Hey, Brother Copeland, good to see you today. And my dad turned around and looked at the other man and said this, Hey, Brother so-and-so, man, isn't it a great day today? We were all in the car and we thought, who is that? Just five seconds earlier, it was, ah, 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 and then, hey, Brother so-and-so, sure is. Hey, you know, we're all guilty of that. And not the same circumstances, but the same life. We're all guilty of putting on a show. Tonight's theme is this, the Christian family. Can I take you to a random passage of Scripture? Matter of fact, I, this passage of Scripture absolutely amazes me. Go, if you would please, to 2 Kings, the book of 2 Kings. Look, if you would please, at chapter number 6. 2 Kings chapter number 6. I want you to see this. This is a powerful passage. Matter of fact, this passage of Scripture is kind of out of place. If you'll, and I don't mean that criticizing the Word of God, please understand. What I'm saying is this, there's nothing preceding this passage that gives any indication about this, and there's nothing following this passage that follows up on what's being said. This is almost like a parenthesis in a sentence or in a paragraph, and it's taking six verses, and it's almost like these six verses are just parenthetically in, in, infused into this passage of Scripture. I was taught as a preacher boy, always know what the context of the scripture is. The context of this scripture, six verses. Nothing preceding it, nothing following it. It's almost as if you wonder, why God did you put this here? In, in uh, 2 Kings chapter number 6, look at or 7 verses, look at verse number 1. 2 Kings chapter number 6, verse number 1, the Bible says this. Now the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. The word straight literally means too small, too constricted. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thee hence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there that we may dwell. And he, Elisha, answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. In other words, Elisha, we want to go do this, but we want you to go with us. Will you go with us and help us? And Elisha answered at the end of verse number three. And he answered, I will go. 
So he went with them, verse 4, and they came to Jordan, and they cut down wood. Do you get the picture here? Here in this passage of Scripture, a group of prophets, a group of preachers, a group of preacher boys, young students studying the Word of God, they come to the preacher and they say, Hey, hey, Elisha, we, we want to we wanna grow. We want to see things expand. We're where we're at right now. It doesn't contain us. We can't fit everybody in the place. So, Elisha, we want to go and we want to build something bigger and better for us. Elisha says, Great idea. Let's do it. So they say, Okay, but Elisha, we want you to go. Elisha says, all right, I'll go with you. We'll all work together. We'll band together as a group, and we'll build this thing. And listen to what happens here. The Bible says in verse number 5, But as one was felling a beam, felling means cutting down. The beam is a, a tree. As one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried, saying, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand, and he took it. What an amazing passage of Scripture. And again, later study it. There's nothing preceding it. And after that last verse, number 7, nothing else follows it. There's no explanation of the passage of Scripture. Except for it's an amazing miracle that God allowed Elisha to perform. So why is this passage here? What is God trying to teach us? Your pastor said it just a few moments ago. All Scripture is given by inspiration to God. And is profitable to us tonight in 2022. This passage of Scripture is written to us. Juniata Baptist Church, guess what? God wrote this passage of Scripture for you and me tonight. Well, what does this mean then? What is God trying to teach us? I look at this passage of Scripture and I, I see some correlations with what's going on in our lives here today. I, I, I see this is a great picture of our homes, of our life that we live. I, I see some representation. I see that axe handle. That axe handle that man's holding is a picture of our lives as Christians. Do you understand that? I've got an axe handle over here. Thank you for doing it. And I promise not to try not to break it. This is a pretty good, pretty good stick right here. I, you can do some damage with that. This, this axe handle, those men were out there working away. We don't have an axe head on it. I don't think your pastor trusted me with an axe in church. And uh, they didn't, definitely didn't let me bring one on a plane today. That's for sure. But this axe handle, if you've ever been out cutting wood, man, that's hard work. That, that's a job that, that not just everyone can do. Matter of fact, there's a whole lot of men who won't do that kind of work because it is hard, hard, and dangerous work. You imagine these men, a bunch of preachers out there, and they're all out there, the Bible says, felling the wood, chopping that wood. I mean, they're busy at it, trying to knock those trees down to build a place for themselves. And while one of the men was chopping that wood, he's hitting away, and as he's hitting, off the end of the, the, the axe handle goes the axe head into the water. By the way, that'd be my luck. Hey, can I borrow your car? I wreck it. That's, that's me. So don't let me borrow your car. Here's this guy, he's borrowing an axe, hand, an axe and he's, he's chopping the wood and he's chopping the wood as he's chopping. And by the way, praise the Lord, it went in the water and not against his friend. You know, that, that could be, hey, buddy, I'm sorry about that. Let me pull that out of your head. He, he, the axe, axe head goes in the water. Hey, that stick, you know what that stick represents? That stick represents our lives. It represents our lives as Christians. That axe handle, and again, this is going to make sense here in just a minute. It represents our lives as Christians. That axe head represents the power of God. Hey, can I tell you? Our lives, no matter how hard we work, we can get busy beating on things, doing the work of God, but without the power of God, it's pointless. It's just nothing but a bunch of noise. Just, just whack it going on. Well, he's going to do something wrong. What's he doing? You're going to damage something. Don't you? No, without the power of God, it's a waste of time. I look at this passage of Scripture. By the way, those trees that he's chopping down, you know what they represent? They represent our home. They represent our church. 
Say, what, what are you talking about? You see, these men went out this day working in the field, and they're laboring. They're, doing the, they're trying to accomplish something in their home, in their church, in their life, with their family, with their kids, and they're working hard at building their home, building their church, building their life. And while you're busy working, hear this guy as he's swinging the stick, off the end of it goes the axe head. Wouldn't you agree with me? It'd be pretty dumb for that guy to pretend like the axe head was still on the axe handle, right? Okay, no one's agreeing with me now. It would be, it would be crazy for that guy out there, while everyone else is around him working, he's swinging that axe. Off goes the head of the axe. But he's like, I'm just going to keep acting like I'm doing something. And he's still beating against the tree. Every one of us would look at a person like that and say, what's your problem? You're never going to accomplish anything. Hold on. You're never going to accomplish anything for God without the axe head. What does the axe head represent again? The power of God. Hold on. Our homes, I'm getting a little preachy here. Our homes are an utter failure without the power of God. Hey, teenager, you're wasting your time trying to honor or obey mom without the power of God. Hey, hey wives. It, it's like beating your head against a brick wall, trying to get kids to honor and obey you without the power of God. Here's what it is. I am going to make them do it. And you're making a lot of noise. And you look like you're doing something great. Hey, I've been in church all my life. By the way, how, how many of y'all have been in church at, oh, let's say, 20 years or longer? You've been going to church, not necessarily this church, but at church. You've been in church 20 years or longer, 30 years or longer. I'm going to keep going. 30 years or longer. Wow. 40 years or longer. I need to sit down and some of y'all need to do the preaching. 50 years or longer? Wow. 60? Some of y'all are going, stop asking because you're making me tell my age. Hey, you know what, you know what I do know? But let me ask you this. How many of y'all have been in church less than a year? You've been in church less than a year. Wow. How many of you have been in church since about nine months before you were born? Your mama took you to church in her womb. You were there. Hey, you know, some of us, we've been in church so long, we know how to act. We could tell stories about how parents ought to raise their children. You've been in Walmart or whatever grocery store you might have, and you see the other family walking through Walmart, and you're like, ah, I know what that kid needs. That woman needs to take that kid home and teach him some Bible lessons of discipline. From the, But we, we know how to tell everyone else how to do it. Have you ever been watching a football game? How many of you men like to, or, or women, forgive me, how many of y'all like to watch football? Yeah, you're in. Yeah, go Titans, by the way. How, how, some of you are like, who? Is that an NFL team? Uh, that, I, I like to watch football. Have you ever sat in your recliner or your couch at home watching a football game? And while you're watching the football game, yell at the TV screen and say to that quarterback, Ryan Tannehill, don't throw it to the other team. That's Titans quarterback. Why'd you throw the ball to the other player in the first series, the first time you touched the ball in the playoffs? You threw it right to the other guy. What are you thinking, Ryan? Come on, throw it to the team with the same color jersey on. How, how many times are we guilty of doing something like that? Because it's a whole lot easier. It's a whole lot easier to tell someone else how to do something than to do it yourself. It's a whole lot easier to look real good swinging that ox handle, being busy. Hey, I've been in church all my life. What's happened to my kids? I've been in church all my life. What's wrong with my marriage? I've been in church all my life. What's wrong with my home? It seems like it's crumbling. I've been in church all my life. Well, why is it that it seems like everything's falling apart? I'll tell you why. Because just as this young man is swinging that axe handle, and it's not doing any good. Why? Because the power of God has to be there. 
God's got to get in your home. I, I know that is like a Captain Obvious statement. You're like, duh. We came to church for that. Obviously, we know we want God in our marriage. We want God in our home. Uh, we know it here. But we don't let it flow through. How, how often is it? You, you've got a fantastic pastor, by the way. That's a good time to say amen. Amen. You've got a fantastic pastor. Hey, can I tell you this? This man studies the Bible. He'll labor over a passage of Scripture. And he'll stand in this pulpit and he'll preach the Word of God. And some of us are guilty of coming to a service and hearing your pastor preach. And we're like this. I already know that. No big deal. <gasps> all right, come on. Time to go. How, how guilty are we? We're all guilty of that from time to time. How does that happen? I'll tell you how it happens. We let the axe head get off and we keep swinging the stick. I'm still faithful in church. I'm still doing what I'm supposed to do. But there's no power. Why? Because God's not in it. How do we get God? See, here's this, here's this man. He's out swinging. He says in verse 5, But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, Master! You know what happened? This young man, he's, he, he came to the point, by the way, I, I wrote this down in my notes. Some are content not to work at all on their home. What would that be? That'd be the people who said, when these prophets came to Elijah and said, hey, Elijah, we need to build a place. We need to grow. Some of those people probably looked at those, those others and said, ah, come on. We don't need to do that. Come on, everything's fine as it is. Why do we need to change anything? I'm content with not doing anything else. I have a preacher friend, literally, who just a few weeks ago, he, he's, he's a very, very good guy. Very aggressive, wants to see the church grow, wants to see it prosper. But the church didn't. And just a few weeks ago, they said, we're done with you as our pastor because you're pushing us to do more than what we want to do. Some people are content not to get busy in the work of God. Some people are content when everyone's out there swinging the axe, doing the job. Some people are content just to sit back and drink the sweet tea. Oh, yeah, y'all stay busy. That's good for y'all. And, and I'm not talking about literal, li the literal work. What I'm saying is some people are content not to let God do something in their life. I, I see that. But I also see this. Some are content just to go through the motions swinging an axe handle. Some people are content to say, Pastor Turpening, I, I'm a, I know I need help in my marriage. I know I need help in my family, but I'm, I'm just going to come to church and Sit in my pew. You mind your business, Pastor. Don't get in my space, and I won't get in yours either. I'm in my place. I've got my Bible. I'll sing the songs, but don't ask too much of me. And then there's others who say, you know what? An axe handle with no power is useless. God, I want your presence in my home. God, I want your power in my home. God, I want you to get a hold of my children. God, I want you to get a hold of my marriage. God, I want you to get a hold of my parents and my aunt and my uncle. God, I want you to do a work in my life. God, I need your power. I don't want to just be swinging an empty axe handle, making a lot of noise. So, Brother Kurt, what, what are you getting at? The key to you having a Christian family, Christian home, isn't sitting in a pew. The key to you having a, a, a successful, happily married uh, relationship with your spouse, the, the key to that isn't you buying flowers for her, although that may be a good idea. That's not the key to it. Ma'am, the key to it isn't having a good supper on the table when he comes home from work, although that may not be a bad thing either. But that's not the key to a successful marriage, a successful uh, relationship. 
Hey, teenager, the key to having a successful relationship with mom and dad isn't making your bed every day, although that's a probably a pretty good thing to do too. Let me say that again. That's probably a good thing to do too. Clean your room. Brush your teeth. No, really, brush your teeth. That's not the key to it. You know what the key is? The power of God. God's presence in your home. That's not just for pastor. That's not just for a youth leader. God's presence in your home. How welcome is God at your address? I know what the answer is. Oh, he's always welcome. No, how welcome does he feel in your address? Can, can God walk through the doors of your home and listen to the last conversation you had with each other? I'll hit this later in the week. The Bible says in Colossians 3, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You know what the word bitter means? I had to study this out. I've been a youth pastor for 28 years, so I'm not really the smartest person in the, in the room, but I love to study. The word bitter, you know what it means? It means harsh. How many ever, how, uh, you don't have to answer that. Let me just tell you. I remember helping my dad work on the car as a little kid. I mean, I was that little tyke. And my dad always wanted to teach me how to work on the car, although we never had a car that worked. So I don't know. Anyway, that's, that's a whole other topic. But I remember my dad say, Bert, he called me Bert instead of Kurt sometimes. He said, Bert, come on out here, help me. Help me work on the car. I was probably five, six, seven years old. I'm not helping him with anything. He said, go get me a wrench. I, I would probably come back with a screwdriver. I had no idea even what, what the tools were. And he was trying to teach me. But usually my number one job, working with my dad on the car, you want to know what it was, the number one job? Hold the flashlight. Because we never worked on the car in the daylight, and I don't understand why we didn't. But it was always nighttime. You're getting eaten by mosquitoes or working in the snow and, and holding the flashlight. And I've got ADHD. I've never been diagnosed, but I know I have it. My wife will tell you I have it. And I, I, I hold that flashlight, and I'll, I'll have it. My dad will say, put the light right here on this. I'll put the light right there on that. And he'll say, make sure it stays right there the whole time. Okay, yes, sir. And literally within two minutes, I'm like. <whistles> and as I'm looking up at the stars, the flashlight follows me. And my dad would reach back and go, Pull! put the light right here, you dumb cluck. I don't know what a dumb cluck is, but I got called a dumb cluck a whole lot. Backhand, right, put the light right here. Oh, put the light back on there. And, and literally, two, three minutes later, I'm like, oh, la, 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 la. And it's, put the light right here. He backhand me again. Can't you hold the light right? And I remember I, I, my dad would say, look at me. And I'd look at him. And as I looked at him, the light went with me. And I'm like, stop blinding me with the light. He, man, I get, and it, you know what the Bible says? Don't, husbands, don't be harsh. Well, that's how I am. No. No. We can make the excuses that that's how we are. But that's not the power of God. See, the presence of God in a marriage so is this. Hey, son, let me show you how to do this right. Or just go get one of those magnetic lights and stick it on there and don't worry about it. No, I'm just kidding. No, the love of God or the power of God in your life means I'm going to show love to that person instead of jumping their case. I want God's presence in my home. I don't want to be swinging an empty axe handle. I want God's power because there's a whole lot of people in our society that make a whole lot of noise and accomplish nothing because there's no power of God in their home. My time's up. You sit here tonight, this whole weekend is designed for this one purpose. God, I want your presence in my home. Can I be brutally honest? And I'm talking about my home. I'm not preaching down at anybody. God's power and God's presence isn't in many homes today. Because we're too worried about the dollar. 
We're too worried about the career. We're too worried about our position in life. We're too worried about worldly entertainment. We're not willing to let God take control in our home. I want God's power. You say, Brother Kurt, how do I get God's power and God's presence? Well, hopefully this week we'll learn a little bit more about that. But can I give you in a nutshell one good starting point? And I'm not trying to milk anything here tonight. Here's a good starting point. Us humbling ourselves, saying, God, I need you. God, I don't have all the answers. God, I'm miserable trying to work this out on my own. God, I'm just making noise. I'm not getting anything accomplished. God, I'm tired of this mess. Or I'm tired of not accomplishing what I should be accomplishing. So God, I kneel before you. And God, I ask you for forgiveness. Some of you are thinking, Man, I sure hope my wife's listening to this one. Man, she sure need no. Well, that's a problem then. Because maybe she does need it, but if you're thinking that, guess what? You need it just as much, if not more. God, I sure hope my kids are listening to this one. No, we're telling ourselves. The old song is this, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me. Hey, sir, can I challenge you tonight? Put the axe head back on there. Put it back on there. Get God in your home. Sir, get God in your home. Ma'am, if that knuckle-headed guy like I am, you know, thick scold, like hard to learn anything, like me, if your husband's like me, maybe you might have to say, God, I need you. If he's not going to, God, I, I really want your presence in my life. That, by the way, that doesn't mean you look at him and say, I knew you wouldn't do it. That, that's not going to get you anywhere. But maybe, ma'am, you just need to say, God, I want your presence in my life. A teenager. God wants to be a part of your life. No, really. God wants to be a part of your life. And you're just swinging a stick with no axe head on it? You're wasting your time. Why is mom and dad always on my case? Well, if you get the axe head back on the axe handle, you get the power of God, the presence of God in your life, it changes everything. You stand here tonight. I want to see God do something this week. It all starts as a Christian family with the presence of God. Stop swinging a stick. Let's get the presence of God back in. Tonight, can I ask you to do this? We'll get in some more nuts and bolts as we go through the week. But can I ask you to do this? Would you be willing tonight just to say to God, God, really do want your presence in my home really want your presence I, I'm not talking about being a fanatic I'm not talking about being weird I'm not talking about coming to church with a family Bible walking in all right kids everyone line up here and we're all gonna I, I'm not talking about weird stuff what I'm talking about is this just letting God have control of your home are you willing to say to God tonight God I need you. God, I need you. If so, tonight, would you just tell him that? We're going to close in a word of prayer. I didn't ask you about an invitation. I, didn't, I, don't, I don't even know what you... I'll, I'll start and I'll leave it to you. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, husband and wife, maybe you ought to come pray together. Well, that's kind of weird. No, no, no. That's putting the axe head on there. Sir, for you to kneel at an altar and out loud with your wife say, God, I need you. 
God, I want your power in my life. God, I want to be the right kind of husband. I want to be the right kind of daddy. I want to be the right kind of employee. God, I want you in my life. God, please get that axe head back out of that water. Let's put it back on the axe. Why don't you pray that with your wife? Why, why don't you get your kids together? And sir, why don't you pray out? I know it's tough. It's not cool. It's not macho. Oh, no, it's, it's godly. It's amazing. For your kids to hear you say, God, I need you. God, I want you in my life. I want you in my marriage. God, I want your presence. I'm going to pray. After I pray, we'll, we'll interpret and do whatever you see fit. But would you let God get right in the middle of your marriage, your home, your children? Hey, grandparents, you're one of the greatest influences on your grandkids. I, I, I look back, and I'll tell more about this later in the week too, but I look back on my grandparents, my grandmothers especially. Both of my grandfathers died when I was real little. My grandmothers had such a godly influence in my life. I remember him saying, they used to call me Blondie. Blondie, God's got something big for you. I remember listening to him pray. What a godly influence my grandmother's had in my life. Same for you. You could be that influence. Lord, I thank you for your goodness. A random passage of scripture in 2 Kings. But a picture really of our homes, of our churches, of our personal lives. And God, there's some maybe in this room that are just content not to do anything. I'm not responding. I'm not. I don't need. There's some in here that are content to just keep acting like everything's okay. Swinging a stick with no accent on there. Faithful in ser church and faithful in services. Faithful doing what they're expected to do, but no power. But God, I pray there'd be a common bond of Christians at Junietta Baptist that love you, that want your power and your presence in our lives. God, would you work? This week, God, would you draw us close to you? God, would you help us in our families? in our homes. And God, would you get the honor and glory. May there be men tonight who'd humble themselves, take their wife by the hand, and lead their family, and grab their kids, and pray together as a family. And God, to ask for your power and your presence. And Lord, this week as we talk about how to have that power and presence, God, I pray that we'd start the ball rolling tonight with just understanding we need you in our homes. God, please work. America is crumbling. Our churches are crumbling. And it's all because our families are crumbling. So God, give your presence in our homes. Thank you for loving us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we'll, we'll have the piano play. And as the piano plays, let's all stand to our feet. Can I encourage you tonight? God's spoken to your heart. I'm going to get my wife and I'm going to go to the altar with my wife. I'm going to pray out loud to my wife and let her know that I want God's power and presence in our home. Would you join us, sir? Would you lead your family in that? Let's get God's power and God's presence back in our homes. Let's talk to God about it, Pastor. Many have begun to come. The charge has been made. Do you want God in your life? Do you want the presence of God in your family? I asked you this earlier. You're going to get real with God this week. We need the presence of God in our life. The front is open. Maybe even right there in your pew, you need to sit down with your wife, with your family and ask for God's presence.
Lord, we thank you for working in our lives. We thank you for working in our families. Lord, help us to seek your face daily, uh, that the power of God, the presence of God might be evident in our homes, in our lives, and throughout this community and the world. Lord, we love you, and we thank you so much for this challenge from God's word. May we continue to be tender to the working of the Holy Spirit in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Uh, if we have a couple, do we have a couple guys? Good. Um, we're going to go ahead and give a, do a love offering this evening for uh, the Copelands. They uh, are, they're come up for us, uh, with us for the week, and so I want us to make sure that we're a blessing back to them. We're going to take up a love offering tonight. You don't need to use any of the, uh, the little things there in the front, in the front of you in the pew because everything that comes in this evening will go to the Copelands, all right? So uh, would you open, uh, as you open your heart, would you open your uh, checkbooks as well, all right? Uh, they are full-time evangelists, and, and they need our help to keep them on the road, all right? What a, what a way to start, huh? Uh, praise the Lord. We've been talking just recently about the Christian tumbleweed, uh, full, uh, full of motion but empty of life, and really that just goes right along with it. So thank you so much. Uh, be back on Friday. Amen? Amen. Amen. Not enough. We'll, we'll, we'll try it again in a little bit, all right? Be back on Friday. A couple of quick announcements. Friday, 7 o'clock, be back for another uh, just a great time together as the family here. And then on Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, ladies, we have our ladies brunch here in the gymnasium. And uh, you don't want to miss that, ladies. Make sure if you know of somebody you've maybe invited over this last week or two that are coming, if you could sign them up to let us just know about the, so we can have a rough estimate of the number. And then later on that day, 4 p.m. over at the Corrells house, uh, guys, sign up for the All-American Shootout. It's going to be great. Maybe just to go and watch Brother Kurt miss a bunch of targets. I don't know. Uh, but come on out for that. Sign up for that as well. And uh, looking forward to a great time there. Invite your uh, unsaved friends that maybe, you know, guys, this is a perfect opportunity. I, we, we've seen it happen the last several years. Unsaved friends come to things like this uh, because it's just something they're interested in. It's not in the church building. It's a time of fellowship. And we get an opportunity to meet and just uh, love on them. So, guys, use this opportunity to bring out maybe an unsaved coworker, somebody uh, your uh, unsaved neighbor that's into shooting, all right? So uh, use it, all right? Use these opportunities for God's glory, all right? Let's go ahead and uh, have the men come down for this evening's love offering for the Copelands. On Sunday, we're going to be have, we'll have them for both the morning and the evening service as well. I'm just excited. I'm thrilled to have them here. And uh, as you already, I'm sure, have been blessed, uh, you know what this week will be entailing, all right? Uh, Brother Ray, would you lead us in a word of prayer for our offering tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing the Copelands to us this week. Help us be a blessing to them uh, throughout the week. And our giving tonight, we just pray that uh, we might be pliable throughout the week, that you might just work in our hearts and lives and be a witness. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
I don't think, did we have a, a closing song? I can't remember. I can't remember. Do we have a closing song back there, Brother Adam? All right, bring it on up. I don't have my order in front of me. Lord be glorified. Excellent. Let's go ahead and stand as we're dismissed this evening. Remember, teens, we are going to take off for our activity here in just a little bit. Uh, stick around uh, for that. And uh, stick around for some fellowship and be back on Friday. Let's sing that chorus. Just uh, let's sing all three stanzas in my life, in my home, and in our church. Lord be glorified. Let's sing it together. In my life. I Let's just sing it together. Ready? In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. In my
to take our sin, the spotless light. 